So hello there. And I am wondering um, how you would feel if you found out that there was a caged man in your neighborhood. Um, when I found out, even though I realized it was 230 years ago, I was still very upset and sad. And I thought, how could this happen in my village of Buckland? It is so beautiful here and so serene. And as I looked further into it, I found that, yes, there had been a man in a cage, and he was in a cage for 57 years in Buckland right down the street. And I found also, though, that he had left an incredible legacy, a legacy that helped revolutionize the care of the mentally ill throughout the United States. So who was this man, this boy? Well, his name was Josiah Spaulding, Jr., and he was the local minister's son. He was the heir apparent to the ministry. And because of that, he was given uh, highly advanced books and was educated very differently than the other children in the village. He studied Latin. He read the Cicero and memorized the two to three books in the Aeneid. And he also memorized the four evangelist books in the Bible in Greek. So he was very intelligent. So what happened? to turn him, this heir apparent, in from the golden boy of Buckland to the caged boy. Well, there were four critical events that happened for him. When he went off to apply for William, at Williams College Seminary, he was rejected. He was told to go back home and to study more, and maybe he might get in, but there was no guarantees. This was a huge blow for the village and for himself and his father. Because without this education, he would not be able to take over his father's job um, as a minister. So he went back home to Buckland uh, fairly disgraced. Second thing that happened was then his father and himself began arguing nightly. And the villagers could hear that. and. Uh, sound travels easily in my village. You can hear a lot of things. And he, they, they fought about religion. And his father was a Calvinist minister. And Josiah, who was following in his peers' step, uh, footsteps, wanted a kinder, more humane religion. His father was the exact opposite. So they were disagreeing about a very basic premise in that village. And the townspeople heard, and it made them very fearful because they saw their um, basis of their lives being stirred up. Um, the third thing was, in the village at this time, there was a lot of death. Um, it was uh, cholera, TB, were killing the people, whole families were dying, babies, neighbors, and the village, and they didn't know about um, the tuberculosis as a disease. They were being told by the minister and their religion that the illness was coming from the fact that they were evil um, and that something was very wrong in the village. And the only thing they could do to stop this dying of their children and their family is to find the evil in their village and cage it and then repent. So that, so the, the final part of Josiah's downfall was that his father, with the nightly argument, said, Josiah, you've got to get out of here. You've got to go get a job. You know, you've... You, you've got to move on. And so Josiah did, which he did. He followed his father's guidelines all the time. He went and got a job in Sanderson as a teacher. Well, very quickly he was sent home because he had had an altercation in the classroom. And we don't know what that was, but he was fired. So he came, now he is 
fully without any direction at all, living back at home again. And his, he, his father, he's marginalized, he has, the village is fearful of him. So one night, Josiah drank too much alcohol. He got very drunk, he got onto his horse, and rode up and down the streets of Buckland, hooping and hollering, and made a public display, public drunken display. And his father and the village people said, that's it. You can't do this anymore. We need to control you. So they got an a manacle, oxen manacle, and they put it around his ankle. And they took him up to his bedroom and hammered the other side of the manacle into his bedroom floor. And that's where he was for one and a half years. He would hear downstairs, he could hear his family, he had four sisters also, at nightly prayers, they prayed every night in front of the fireplace. He could hear them praying. And his sisters would hear him uh, right above them, begging and pleading to be released from his uh, prison. And they didn't. One night, this was a year and a half, one night, finally, after he was rubbing uh, the, the chain on the floor, it burst apart, and he was able to leave his room. As he was leaving his room, his little sister Lydia, who was eight years younger, was terrified of him. She ran to get her father, and the father went to go get the, a, a village person to help him. Josiah rushed out and got into the barn, got on his horse, and was just making his getaway when the father and the village person came into the barn, overpowered him, and brought him back up to his room. And that was the closest uh, he was ever going to get to escaping. So they, had, they tied him up in his room. They realized, well, we need something more for him to contain him. So they had a wooden cage built. They brought the wooden cage up to the bedroom and put Josiah in it. He was in it. They padlocked it. Um, he was screaming all sorts of obscenities. And he ripped his clothes off and crawled into the farthest corner of the cage and sat there crying. And he was going to be in that cage for 57 years. Um, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> 57 years, his parents had an adjoining room, and um, they made a peephole. Well, there's the village, and I'll, I'll go on to my slides. That's the uh, church. Now, that's the, the uh, grinding of his uh, chain on the floor, and it's there to this day. Now, this is the peephole his, on the adjoining uh, bedroom. His parents watched him for 14 years. And at the peephole, I'm, I'm pacing you closer to it. Now you can start to see into it. And that bed is where his cage was. This is the room, and then uh, you can see the um, grinding. And then they refinished the floor, and they could see the cage. And there's the cage stained there right on the floor. So for 14 years, his parents watched him in the cage through the peephole, and they cared for him. Uh, he, then his parents died. His mother died, and then his father died uh, three months later, and he had no one else to care for him. His sisters had already married. So Lydia, who was the sister who told on him, who was terrified of him, said, and she was due to, when she grew up, she married and had a farmhouse up the street, and she said, I'll take my brother in. Um, and she was due to have a baby any day. So they needed to move him to Lydia's farmhouse. So the townspeople again went down, they had to disassemble his cage, and they brought him out into the, down the stairs, out into the meadow, he hadn't been out in 14 years. And they paraded him. It was a horrible, horrible parade. 
of Josiah up the steep hill across the common in front of his father's big, white, graceful church. He struggled. He struggled very much. But he, did, he was no match for the villagers because the cage was only five foot tall. So Josiah was walking. He was only up. He could only walk 45 degrees. That was all he could do. He hadn't walked. He was shuffling. He hadn't put one foot in front of another. So he, they paraded him up. He was naked, and he had chains on him. And they paraded him into Lydia's farmhouse. They put him up into the back room, reassembled his cage, put him in. And that's where he would stay in that cage, in that room, for another 37 years. So he was at his parents 14 years in the cage and then in Lydia's farmhouse for 37 years in the cage. And with my research, I have found probably that Lydia's farmhouse is my house and that the room he was in is my laundry room. So three years. So then I didn't realize I'd get touched by this. Um, so there he was. Then his caregivers had to leave after the 34 years. The only place to put him next was the poor farm. So up he went to the poor farm with the cage, and he was up there for three years. He died at 81, naked, in the cage, Christmas Eve, alone. And he was buried in an unmarked grave in Buckland Cemetery next to his father who caged him. So, yes, that's a pretty sad story. And there really is hard to see some light around it. But surprisingly, there is a light. And that light, that legacy, is named Mary. Mary's was, I'm going to go quickly, Mary was Lydia's daughter, Mary was the baby that she had. And Mary watched her mother. Mary grew up with her uncle in the cage and watched her mother, Lydia, care for the uncle. She didn't do it in a good way. She was terrified of him. She didn't bathe him, clothe him, feed him. Mary died. Lydia died. Mary had a new stepmother. Lois. Lois came in, and she loved the caged man. She made him his favorite food. She cleaned his cage. And with that, he started to talk. He started to come around. Mary saw that, and now Mary's grown. She grew up. She goes off to college. She goes to Mount Holyoke College and went down to Alabama, worked in the, with the Civil War soldiers. She met Dorothea Dix down there. They both were working in the field. They became very good friends. They then, Civil War ended. Mary came back to Buckland to continue to care for her uncle. Dorothea went off to Boston with a new crusade. Oh, there is just, you can see how they, Josiah, Lydia, and then Lydia had Mary. Dorothea Dix became, she had a crusade. She decided she wanted to go and help the mentally ill that are in cages, stalls, and barns, through jails, and all through the hills. She actually came to Mary's house in Charlemont and documented that Josiah was in a cage. She also went to many other cities, I mean villages, and documented that. She took that documentation called The Memorial, which is a book, and she went in front of the Boston legislature. This is a sample of it. This is, she go, went to Lincoln, a woman in a cage. Medford, an idiotic subject. Charlemont, one man caged. That was Josiah. So Dorothea Dix got American mental institutions. She started them. But then they became corrupt because the superintendents that were overseeing them realized that they could overcrowd and take the money themselves. 
and so overcrowding of mental institutions occurred. The superintendents were taking the money. Now, again, we have an incredibly unbelievable bright light that came from Josiah. And this is Frederick. Frederick was Mary's son. And Mary had to, Mary decided she had to put her uncle on the poor farm because she wanted to take Frederick to be educated, get a college education, which she did. He went and became a doctor. He went and became a superintendent himself of a mental institution in Washington. He revolutionized that mental institution. He took people out of straitjackets. He sent them home if they were well. He bathed them. He gave them beds and clothing. He even went up to Alaska, then with Mary, to start a mental institution up there. So when we look at the, the, then in the 60s, we had the de deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill because the state hospitals had gotten really uh, bad. So they had the mental people, mental illness people come out into the streets, but they also had outpatient clinics for them and closed down the mental institutions. What is happening, what is happening now is some of those mentally ill people are on the streets. And from the streets, they're now going to jails. And from jails, they're going into solitary confinement. Right now, there are 80 to 100,000 people right now in solitary confinement. And an inordinate amount of them are mentally ill. So we look back and we think we're much more evolved than 230 years ago. We would never put a mentally ill person in a cage but we do. Uh, it's better, but we do. So we need to still keep looking at how we are treating the mentally ill. I would like to make, this is, this is Josiah's community. We're in it. I would like to make an apology, public apology to Josiah and say we are sorry that we as a community put you in a, in a cage you weren't mentally ill to begin with. You just were disagreeing with your father. We are sorry. And we are sorry for all the people that have been caged and are caged right now. We will try to do our best to get you out of that cage as soon as we can. We're sorry. <laughs>